Some of my favorite stories are ones I don't tell very often because they're the scary stories. Stories that send lizards up and down your spine that get in there and they haunt the hearts and minds. Uh, I love it when I hear them, but they scare me so much. And even as a kid, I couldn't, I couldn't really hear them. And we moved from the city to the country, and I remember I was so scared the silence would scare me. I'd say, Mom, it's so quiet. And she'd go, it's just your imagination. Oh, then it was worse, because then it could be anything. I remember when I was a kid, my imagination had a tendency to wander, and I would follow it. And I would just get lost, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't know where I was. Like, one time I followed a song for three miles, and when it was over, I looked around and didn't know where I was. Uh, I had to go to a hospital, and they called my parents, and they came and got me. So they were worried about me, so they would have my sister walk me home from school. Um, my brother used to walk me home from school, but uh, one time uh, we were passing a convenience store on the way, and my brother goes, let's go in. I go, no, Steve, we're not supposed to. He goes, no, I checked. It's okay. And now... I knew he was lying. I don't know. Have you ever you've heard of George Washington, right? Our first president. Well, he couldn't tell a lie. It was impossible. Uh, uh, but my brother didn't suffer from that condition. No. Uh, my dad used to say lying was his way of releasing carbon dioxide. So I say, Steve, we're not supposed to go in that convenience store. He goes, I'll buy you an icy. Okay. He won lie about an icy. So we go in and I go right up to the icy machine. Now there's two flavors, right? Red and blue. But I made another flavor called purple by mixing the two together. Yeah, it's an experiment, you can try it. So I'm making my icy and I've got the blue in there and I'm going with the red and I get to the top and I go to turn it off, but it won't shut off. And I try again, it won't shut off and it's pouring over the cup. I yell to my brother, I go, Steve, Steve, get over here. And he comes over, he goes, go get some help. So I go to get the clerk and we come back, me and the clerk, and there's my brother. Okay, he has filled up every single Coke cup, every single coffee cup. He's even filled up hot dog boats and all the ketchup containers. And when he ran out of things to fill up, he started to fill himself up. He had his mouth over the spigot, oh, 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 and he's down in it. And the clerk goes, what are you doing, kid? And my brother starts to explain, but that's when he gets the biggest ice cream headache in the universe. And he's going, oh, Ah, ah, my brains, my brain, my brain, my brains, my brains. And the clerk's like, please, please, please. So that's why my sister walked me home from school. And uh, I remember one day, a letter comes from the school. And it's for my brother. And my mom looks at it and she goes, do you know anything about this, Stephen? And he releases carbon dioxide. He goes, no. She goes, it's from the school. And they say that uh, you didn't finish one of your classes and uh, you have to take summer school. And I can tell by the look on my brother's face, summer and school should never be in the same sentence. And then she says, and you waited so long that uh, they, there's only one class left and it's called Norway camp. And my brother says, I can't go, I don't wanna go to, no, don't make me go to Norway camp. My mom says, you're going. When my mom says you're going, you are going. My mom was amazing. I mean, I think my mom could have ruled a country, but she picked our family instead. And when she said, you're going, you're going. So <laughs> the next day we take my brother to the bus stop and put him on a bus and I watch him go off. And that's when I realized I'd never spent a whole day without my brother. And uh, I go, dad, dad, I, I wanna go to Norway camp. And my dad goes, I'll take you camping. <laughs> so we go into the backyard and he throws a blanket over the clothesline and then we get out all our blankets and pillows from the beds and we put them inside and that's our tent. And uh, we get in our tent and then it gets dark. And then it gets really dark. And dad and I are in there and, and I go, dad, dad, you have to tell me a story. And he goes, yeah, what, like a fairy tale? I go, no, 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 like, like a, a, a ghost story, a, a scary story. Oh, and it has to be true. My dad says, it has to be true. Yeah, true. And he goes, well, all right. You know, Kevin, we got this property cheap because it used to be an asylum for people with criminal aptitude. I did not know that. Yeah, and it burnt down. But before it did, the most famous inmate escaped, a man called the Collector. 
Why the collector? Because he collected things. What kind of things? Odds and ends. People, odds and ends? No, no, like pieces of wire and two by four. People, no, what do you think? No. But you can always hear him coming because you hear clump, clump, scratch, clump, clump, scratch. Why clump, clump, scratch? Because of the radiator chained to his, his eye? No, his eye, no, get, no, his eye. What did I raise? No, his leg, his leg. And he says, and there was a family, happy-go-lucky family, mom, dad, children, murdered, no, murdered, no, no. They moved away. But before they did, they found in their garage magazine articles, recipes for people with criminal aptitude. So we know he's in the area. Oh, no. And there's one thing he can't stand. What's that? The smell of, yeah, the smell of, yeah, bug spray. But I put on bug spray. You did? Yes, yes, you sorry. You sorry. Put on bug spray. He says, oh, we've got to do some best. What, 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 what can we do? He says, the one smell he can't stand, yeah, yeah, is marshmallows. We have marshmallows. We do? Yes, inside. And graham crackers and chocolate. Yes, we've got all that. So I went in and got graham crackers and marshmallows and chocolate, and my dad built a fire, and we made what he called s'mores, which stands for secret methods of repelling evil. And they really work, because that whole night, we never saw the collector at all. So I was really susceptible to ghost and scary stories. And, uh, but my favorite ones, my favorite ones were stories that were mysteries more than they were ghost stories. I didn't like the ones that scared you, but I like the ones that were mysteries. I still do. Like I have a friend who's a, a pastor at a church and he was on hospice one night where he would sit in front of rooms in, in the hospital and if somebody needed something, they, he would go to the room. Well, there was a man every night whose light came on at two in the morning and he would go in and help the man to the restroom. And every morning, clockwork, two in the morning, the light would come on. Well, the man finally did pass away. And my friend who was the pastor was there the next night. And at two in the morning, the light came on. So my favorite story of mystery was when I was in Boy Scouts and we were around a fire and a guy was visiting. And he told this story because back in 1918, there was another pandemic. Uh, it was called the Spanish flu or uh, the, the flu of 1918. And uh, one fifth of the world's population perished in that, in that flu. And in New York, there were so many children. There were 30,000 homeless children because of that flu. And they called them street urchins. And so all these kids were in the streets and they thought, we've got to do something about these children. So what they did, they put them on trains and brought them to the Midwest and farmers and people around the Midwest from the Dakotas and Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Iowa, they would come and they would uh, adopt these kids. So I'm reading, there's this uh, 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 engineer of one of these trains, this, uh, this, it was called an orphan train. And this guy had been to the East a million times, so many times. He'd gone out there with lumber and brought back furniture. He'd gone out there with flour and brought back pastries. He took people. He brought families together. He, he brought soldiers uh, uh, across the United States. He brought uh, politicians and prisoners. Sometimes that was the same person. And so he, he had been across a whole bunch of that, but he said he was never as nervous as when he took a train full of orphan children. And he had his best crew with him. He said, no, he, he, he had Andy up in the front. He had Tom Murphy back as conductor. He said, it was my best crew. I knew if anyone could make it, it was us. So they go to New York and they're in the Grand Central Station and there's all these kids ready to get on this train. And he said it was tearful. Oh, see, because some of these families just couldn't afford to keep as many children anymore with the losses in their families. And one little kid named Spencer, was saying goodbye to his dad. And it was so heartbreaking. He was standing, the engineer was standing with Tom Murphy. And Tom Murphy said, you know, when we get back to Minnesota, I'm gonna go to that station and my wife and I are gonna adopt one of these kids. We have plenty of love at home and some can surely go to one of these kids. So they loaded everybody up and Spencer got on the train, everybody got on the train. 
and it was harrowing. I mean, the whole way back. It rained and rained. The engineer even had to say it was one of the hardest trips, but they finally got to Cannon Falls, which is a town just south of Minneapolis. So they're almost here. They were in Cannon Falls, one more leg to go, and like usual, if a kid was having a particularly hard time, the engineer brought him up front and put him on a stool so that he could look out the front of the train and maybe take away some of his cares. So he had Spencer up there. And Spencer was sitting on the stool and they just pulled out a cannon falls and it stopped raining, but a fog came in. It was like pea soup, he could hardly see. And he's going along, all of a sudden Spencer goes, look! And the engineer looked, he said, what, what, I don't see it. He said, look, there's a man on the tracks. And the engineer said, I don't see him, Spencer. He says, yeah, he's waving his arms. He's waving his arms up and down. And so the engineer pulled the brakes and the train comes sliding to a halt and a Tom Murphy comes running up and the engineer says, is everybody okay? And Tom says, yeah, yeah, bumps and bruises, but everybody's fine, why did you stop? And the engineer said, well, Spencer saw somebody on the tracks. And so they said, let's go find this guy. So they get off the train and they're walking down the tracks yelling, where are you, where are you, where are you? They couldn't find him and finally they're about to give up. When up ahead, Tom Murphy says, get up here. And Spencer and the engineer run up ahead and there's the Cannon River. The river, because of all that rain, had washed the bridge away. And if that train had kept going, everyone would have perished in that river. Now they really wanted to find this guy. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? They were shouting and yelling. They wanted to thank him. Tom Murphy joked, he said, isn't that just like a Minnesotan? He saves everybody and then goes home for supper. And they were laughing about that, walking back. Oh, man, they were so relieved. When all of a sudden, Spencer, for the second time, says, look. And they turned and they looked. And they said, what? And he says, look. And he points to the headlight of that train. And they looked up and stuck on the front of the headlight of that train was a moth flapping its wings. And when they looked and saw the shadow it cast into the fog, it looked exactly like a man waving his arms. Spencer climbed up on the cow catcher, reached up and pulled that moth free from the headlight and then set it loose off into its new life. I think about those ghost stories. Uh, I think about um, years ago, uh, I was at my mom's house and she has this newspaper from a small town up north. And in this newspaper, it talked about uh, a woman who said her wash machine was haunted, that in, that in the morning, this wash machine would just all of a sudden go on all by itself. And, and she said, I think it's haunted. And the woman next door chimed in and said, it is not. She said, at exactly that time, I saw a UFO over her house. <laughs> so that was her explanation. So <laughs> I think of these UFOs and I remember watching, uh, I went to Lily Tomlin's show on Broadway, uh, Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe. And in this show, she was talking about um, uh, these aliens that came down and she invited them to her show. It's a one woman show. And after the show, the aliens are going, wow, that's the best show we ever saw. And she said, I, they said, all those people were so amazing. And Lily said, no, I was the only one in it. No, no, there was hundreds of people in the show. And that's when Lily Tomlin realized they were facing the other direction. They weren't watching her, they were watching the audience. They thought the audience was the show. And they thought, oh God, it was just brilliant. They just loved that show. I'm thinking of that when I was working up in, uh, Bemidji, Minnesota, Paul Bunyan Playhouse, and there was a ghost up there. And this ghost would all of a sudden show up and everyone was, you know, afraid of this ghost. He never did anything wrong, but everyone would see him. I saw him, uh, the mayor saw him uh, of the town. And I, I mean, and, and I, I was on a radio show with the mayor and I said, have you seen the ghost? And he said, yeah. And uh, I, th I felt so bad afterwards. I said, mayor, I'm so sorry I brought that up because you just told all your constituents that you saw a ghost and he goes, that probably caught, got me more votes than it lost. More people have seen that ghost than haven't. So the theater, though, decided to get a ghost reader to talk to this ghost. They hired this guy named Gary, and he came and set up a legal pad and a pen and paper, and he would write. Well, what he was doing was connecting with his spirit beyond named Betty. Betty would talk to the ghost and then tell Gary what to write. And Gary would just go up and down with his hand and then, uh, and he was just talking to me and his hand is moving while Betty's telling him what to write. 
And then when he was done, uh, 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 he crossed I, dot, uh, T's and dotted I's and put periods in and everything. And then he read this story. Oh, the ghost's name was Dave. And he was hit by a drunk driver. And uh, he, his spirit flew to this theater because it was right outside the theater. And Gary says, yeah, that happens. He said, uh, when, when somebody is, uh, loses life, a lot of times their spirit will fly to the nearest place, a tree or a building. And so Gary flew there and he said, all of a sudden, things he didn't realize were happening. There were kings and queens. He said uh, he was meeting all kinds of people, and every once in a while, just a regular person would be so happy they would burst into song. And Gary turns to me and says, I don't think he knows he's in a theater. And I said, I don't think he, is e he knows either. Don't tell him. He said, no, I won't. And so the ghost said he knows he could travel on, but he really wants to stay finally in his life. He's meeting all the people he hoped he could see. And Gary afterwards said, you know, I can move him to the next life if you want to, if this ghost is scaring you. And uh, we all said, no, no, let him stay. He's, he's not hurting anyone. So everyone voted to let Dave stay. And I was thinking about Dave, and I was thinking about all of us when we go to the stories and we go to theater and we go in and the lights lower and we're all in different places we're all in the same building but we're all different places different parts of the day different lives and when those lights come back up all of a sudden there we are together in this same world and as it moves along some give it a nut, much needed laugh or a cry some people that are feeling alone know that they belong and all of a sudden we realize that we love hate desire as much as any king or queen that ever lived and that's when i realize we are like lily tomlin's show we are the show because we are the kings and queens and great lovers and heroes and the story or the theater It's just reminding us of that and then the lights come back up and we return to ourselves and We look at our fellow audience members like you were there, right? You were there on this night and it was real and we forever after that connect to that moment and that's what I can't wait to happen again when next we meet at Sounds of the Mountains. Thank you. Thank you for watching! Thank you for your donation to Camp Bethel to help us through this tough year. Use the links and the buttons on this page. You can also tip the tellers. Thank, Thank you. you! We hope the festival will be back home in person next year and need your help in getting the camp ready to reopen as soon as possible for summer camps, guest groups, and special events like the festival. Please click on the link below and make your contribution toward the work, the fun, and the fellowship that find a home at Camp Bethel. Thanks for watching, and thank you for your gift.